here and we're in fact going to spend an extra night here just for some, some downtime to catch up with the hundreds of emails that come through on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that um, struck me very much about meeting your group at dinner earlier is how young you guys are. <laughs> and that's one of the messages that I want to take back to South Africa because by and large the, the youngster or, or the, the youngsters there or the young people are missing from the fight. Um, we have a few representatives in local universities, um, but generally um, we don't see it and it's more parents and grandparents that are concerned about what is, what is facing the country there. So brilliant to see you guys and I'm going to take that message back and Sharon has um, my wife Sharon has videoed your, your introduction and it's going to be one of the things that we will use there. So <clears throat> you talked about us facing the same issues and I'd like to, to build on that a little bit. I had planned to build on that and I'm going to read you, if you don't mind, an article that was published on a university website in South Africa recently. I write for them quite frequently and it's, it's a website called Critical Thought. And the reason that I'm sharing it with you is because I want to draw the parallels between what we're facing in America and what we're facing in Africa. And I use the word we, as you'll see as this develops, as the discussion this evening, because we're going to have a discussion and an interaction. Um, we're going to, I'm going to use the word we because I think that we're fighting a global, we're fighting a global campaign. So I'll read this with you too. And this was something that, that is directed at African leaders, but it could just as well be directed at American leaders. <clears throat> An unplanned involvement in the South African anti-fracking lobby catapulted me into a widening study of the in increasing exploitation of African resources by foreign nations from other continents. The results, easily accessible to anyone with internet access, are alarming and it is argued present an overwhelming case for an urgent and concerted response by African countries and the continent as a whole. Manhattan Island, as rumor has it, was acquired in 1626 from Native Americans by the Dutch for 60 guilders. Around the 1700s and later, glass beads were used as a form of currency, especially in Africa by Europeans and colonial overlords. Some of the more common items exchanged for beads included ivory, gold, and slaves. Virtual fortunes in precious goods and people were exchanged for relatively worthless baubles. In the 21st century, only the currency has changed. Africa is still being exploited, but this time with a different goal. This is a clarion call for Africans to wake and stand up. Africa is being sold out from under your feet. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, that I said to you, just swap the word Africa for America. Africa is being sold out from under your feet. Minerals, food, and water are being sold to nations outside of Africa. Nations who have squandered much of their own resources and who are now scrambling for resources that Africans will need in future years. African leaders in many cases have a reputation for facilitating the rape of her resources at the behest of foreigners. The reward? Undreamed of personal riches. Vast cash reserves accumulated and spirited away into secret accounts at the expense of Africa's people. If this view is not valid, the only remaining excuse for selling this continent out is simply that they do not understand what is happening. Nothing in what I now regard as my past life prepared me for the roller coaster of meetings, new relationships and learning that has overwhelmed me during my campaign against shell gas mining in South Africa. As the colloquial and often humorous saying goes, I tell you with tears in my eyes, I share with you this message, except that these are tears of sorrow, not those squeezed out by mirth. I want to tell you about two men and two books. They may not even know of each other, yet they write, write a remarkably similar message. 
The most unlikely bedfellows, one hails from the epicenter of US academia and global resources, the other, a man of the cloth, works and writes from his home base of Nigeria. I have met one and hope to meet the other. Both of their books were published in 2012. Michael T. Clare completed the latest of 14 books, The Race for What's Left. Reverend Nimo Bassi released To Cook a Continent. Clare's book addresses the global scramble for the world's last resources. Bassi writes of destructive extraction and the climate crisis in Africa. Lawrence Summers, the top economic advisor to President Obama in 2009-2010, argued in 1991, within the context that hazardous waste should be disposed of in Africa. Just between you and me, shouldn't the World Bank be encouraging more migration of the dirty industries to the LDCs, the lesser developed countries. I think that the economic logic between dumping a load of toxic waste in the lowest wage country is impeccable. The concern of an agent that causes a one in a million chance, so a change in the odds of prostate cancer, is obviously going to be much higher in a country where people survive to get prostate cancer than where under five mortality is 200 per thousand. So in, in paraphrasing Mr. Summers, one may put it like this, Africans are poor, expendable, because they have a short life expectancy and high mortality rates, and can accept the West's toxic waste with a smile, while their corrupted leaders drive expensive cars and shop in Paris. And Claire, certainly not tainted by the corporate maxim of emotional, often applied to environmentalists and nationalists, writes, and in the near future, the most precious natural resource of all, food, will also become scarce in many parts of the world. He continues, while the planet is currently capable of satisfying the basic nutritional requirements of the existing world population, this capacity will come under threat in the decades ahead. As the population grows, and climate change reduces the amount of rainfall in many areas. To guard against inevitable sh food shortages, government-backed agricultural firms in China, South Korea, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates are already buying vast tracts of arable land in Africa and elsewhere to produce food for consumption at home. Under the heading Invading the Last Frontiers, Claire writes, several factors distinguish the current push for resources from those of the past. To begin with, there are no other as yet undetected frontiers lying below those now under assault. Until now, participants in the depletion of a particular resource zone could always comfort themselves with the thought that undeveloped lands lie somewhere else, still awaiting human exploitation. Today, however, there exist no untilled lands or untapped oil reserves awaiting fresh development. Virtually all accessible resource zones are now in production, except for the extreme areas such as the Arctic, the Congo, the ocean bottom, and unyielding rock formations such as shale gas. There is nowhere else to go. We've seen a three-year quest to explore in the Arctic and the fact that Shell and their cohorts have now retreated from the Arctic with their tail between their legs because nature sent them a message to say this is not a place to draw even when the governments of the world wouldn't stand up to them and say we're not giving you licenses I believe now that the Obama administration is close to cancelling their licenses to drill in the Arctic Claire continues to say, the pursuit of vital materials in remote and marginal areas will also pose extraordinary environmental challenges and will lead to intensified clashes between outside powers and the indigenous people who occupy these areas. You are also indigenous to New York State. You are those people. 
who will clash with the oil and gas industry, who want to come and propagate this extreme energy in your state. And that is exactly what I believe has happened to Royal Dutch Shell in their quest to mine shale gas or frack in South Africa. Having debated Shell and their proponents, studied documents and listened to pro oil and gas rhetoric of Shell and their associates in the industry, I'm confident in saying that their approach to shale gas mining in South Africa mirrors and blends the careless arrogance of Lawrence Summers with the rapacious instincts that drove colonization and exploitation of this continent of Africa and her people for centuries. So confident of Shell that their quest to frack South Africa will be licensed, that they have thrice provided their shareholders and the public with dates on which exploration licenses would be in hand. I'm pleased to tell you tonight that three times those dates have come and gone, and they still don't have their licenses. An illustration of Shell's influence and the impact of their jobs and energy marketing campaign I'm reminding you of the parallels that you face here. In the ruling party, manifested by a thinly veiled ANC shareholding in Shell Marketing and Shell Downstream South Africa. Yes, it's true. Our ruling party has an indirect shareholding in Shell Marketing and Shell Downstream in South Africa, which puts them in the position of being both a player and a referee in this debate. So this illustration is a series of recent statements by a commissioner of our National Planning Commission, a very senior group of people that advises the president, in a meeting of government and private stakeholders in our Eastern Cape province where I was present. Responding to statements by various organizations who expressed deep concern of the potential economic and environmental damage that would be caused by fracking, the commissioner stated <coughs> that agriculture is more polluting and has a greater negative impact on the environment than fracking. Oh. This statement was followed up by one that alleged there have been more than two million wells drilled without a single case of contamination proved in a court. To round it off, the commissioner declared that the revenues to flow from fracking in South Africa would be equitably divided amongst the state, the operators, and the community. I know that you guys have all heard that same rhetoric. And it's three bald-faced lies, one after the other. These three statements, collectively or in isolation, are an indication of the degree of brainwashing that has occurred within the leadership of our country. I'm reminding you again of what I said at the beginning, the parallels between this article in Africa and how it stands in the United States. Coming from one of a select group whose task it is to produce a paper that guides our presidency in the development of this country, it is especially worrying. I have had meetings this afternoon where the people that I met with have expressed the sentiment that they don't understand how the leadership, the decision makers at state and federal level can be making the decisions that they're making. Is it a case of ignorance? Are they getting the wrong information? Or is there some other reason? I have for some, um, in this case a thought leader similar to the people that advise your decision makers, who are also thought leaders, cannot claim to be uninformed. I cannot accept the fact that they are ignorant of the real facts surrounding shell gas mining. Yet the three statements are indefensible. I have for some time been aware of the support for shell gas in the NPC, which is our National Planning Commission, and this was confirmed in the last white paper. What perhaps was not anticipated by Shell and their proponents in South Africa is the growing global backlash against shale gas mining. The extended and new moratoria amongst credible and powerful states, cities and authorities in the United States and Europe and the ever more tarnished reputation of oil and gas 
as many of their reports are exposed as having been purchased and manipulated. It appears to matter not a jot to the fossil fuel barons and their fawning politicos that the very essence of life on earth, our food and water, is being depleted faster than it can regenerate. The quest to frack South Africa, and I'm now paraphrasing as well and adding America to that, the quest to frack South Africa and America represents for me the quintessential icon of what needs to be defeated globally. If we can expose the skewed approach, the environmental risks, and especially the economic downside of shale gas mining, we can strike a mortal blow against those that view our resources as a great shopping basket, brimming with bargains, and equipped with a giant toilet bowl in which to excrete the results of their buying spree. Fracking is at the forefront of fossil fuel hunger. The immense geopolitical power wielded by big oil and gas and the revolving door between corporations and government makes this a fight worth winning for the world and her people. That was the end of the article. I'd like to talk to you about a couple of points that I thought of driving today. <coughs> On exit 22 off, I think it was Highway 81 West, there was a sign that said Iroquois Indian Museum. <coughs> it was the Iroquois that in their great law of peace, in their manual of guidance, the equivalent of today's corporate governance standards, told and stipulated that their chiefs, when making a decision on behalf of the community, would take into account the results and impact of their decision seven <coughs> generations hence. They were probably had an average life expectancy of 50 years. That's 350 years. Today, we might have a life expectancy of 90 to 100 years. So we're talking six to seven hundred years in which those wise Indian chiefs were required to think six to seven hundred years ahead, not four years to the next election or one year to the next corporate balance sheet. The water statistics surrounding the state of Pennsylvania is another thing that has come onto my radar in the last few days. And I'll try and recite some of the statistics accurately. I'm sure that you, most of you are very familiar with it. Pennsylvania is a water state. 40% of the population of America live within one day's drive of Pennsylvania. The Chesapeake Bay supplies water to 16 million people. It's fed by the Susquehanna River which flows out of the area that is being fracked. The river that flows between Ohio and Pennsylvania, which has its sources up there in the area that is being fracked, touches on 14 states. The Delaware River watershed also has its origins and is fed from Pennsylvania. And I see in those facts an enormous lever for the residents of New York, the people that get their water out of the Chesapeake Bay and the 14 states that are touched by the river that flows out of Ohio, where all of Pennsylvania's fracking waste is disposed of, to really bring pressure to bear at a federal level. The state of unemployment and the growth statistics in Pennsylvania do not bear out the claims of the oil and gas industry. Regrettably, I've been in just too much of a rush today to find the reports and articles that I have, but there is very good empirical evidence, government-based, government agency-based, that shows that the jobs, the revenue, the growth that is claimed by the oil and gas industry in Pennsylvania is actually not 
taking place. <coughs> I've been struck by at one stage and on one side the, the coordination and the enormous amount of people that are standing up against fracking in the United States and on the other that the environmentalists in the US don't seem to have enjoyed much of a voice in the mainstream media. I believe <clears throat> that this fight must be a global fight. We are fighting a global enemy and the issues that we're facing in South Africa and Africa and anywhere else in the, in the world, Poland, Romania, Czech Republic, Australia, Ireland, Belgium, France, Italy now, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, are the same issues. They might differ a little bit through the geography and perhaps the culture and laws of the country, but they are the same issues. It's about water, it's about chemicals, it's about trading off the future prosperity of future generations for short-term gains, which our leaders appear to be prepared to do. So we can have a discussion, we're going to open to, to questions and answers just now, which is going to allow me to get a sip of the wine that I so enjoy, coming from Cape Town. I really do enjoy wine. Um, and we can talk about some of the concrete things and the small things and the big things that you can do as a community to take this on globally. But I believe that we have to take it on globally if we try to take them on Americans against the American oil and gas industry or South Africans against Shell alone, we are eventually going to be worn down and run out of money and lose. If we harness the power that this wonderful technological invention of the internet has given us, that puts us literally in the same room 24 seven, we can do a lot with it. It took me, I was telling Hillary Acton, uh, there she is, I was telling Hillary Acton that it took me a couple of months in South Africa to realize that Hillary was actually in the United States. <laughs> because the discussion on Facebook is seamless. And so it, eventually when I went onto a profile, looked, I realized that this woman is in the United States. And that's how effective the medium of communication can be. So. Some things that came out um, in the last few days that, that really struck a chord with me. I don't, can't remember Sharon who it was that said, um, we need to inform people and we need to take this fight forward, if necessary, one person at a time. If you tell one person about it every day, then just take it forward one person at a time. Jerry the DEP talk, the lady that spoke last, the researcher, the teacher. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. Okay, that was that Harrisburg. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other thing that came out last night from Julia at Frag Action was the United States needs something bigger than the U.S. to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. okay. It needs something bigger needs a reaction bigger than just the environmentalists in the United States to solve this problem. And those are the, those, that's the soft underbelly of politics and corporates, is they are concerned about their reputations. They're big, they're visible, they're easy to find, and that's where they are vulnerable. And the internet gives us that ability. So, in closing, I would like to say to you that just like in Africa, young Americans are facing the prospect of having their future prosperity sold out for short-term gains and short-sighted gains. And my message to you is, don't let them do it, America. I believe that we can stand together and we can beat the strike. Thank you. I'll take your question. Something that can uh, 
perhaps tie it into a global uh, strategy. In New York, there's a $10 million ad campaign underway to convince people, you talked about misinformation, you heard it repeated the word lies three times. There's this big prop, corporate propaganda effort underway by uh, a group called the American Petroleum Institute, which is largely foreign owned. So we do have foreigners trying to push fracking here in New York. My question is, how much of that kind of propaganda are you confronted with in South Africa? We face a lot of it. Shell, Royal Dutch Shell is leading the charge. They have um, unilaterally appointed themselves as the ambassadors of shale gas mining. They lie through their teeth. They cannot give me an answer as to their continuous and repeated and well-documented violations in the Marcellus Shale. And so we're faced with that a lot. Um, they will say things like, we are concerned that there are millions of people in South Africa without electricity in their homes. Uh, we are concerned that the state doesn't have revenue. We are concerned about South Africa's shale gas, I'm uh, sorry, uh, CO2 emissions. And so they present themselves as philanthropists. And it becomes an energy security thing. If 485 trillion cubic feet of shale gas were discovered in South Africa, there's no way that South Africa could burn that reserve of gas. Our one gas refinery has been running on 1.5 trillion cubic feet for 30 years. So quite clearly, Shell's plan and the other's plan is to sell that to the East and sell it on it. So the whole argument, as in the United States, with these big processing plants that are being built, or plan to be built, is to export the stuff to the East and then drive the share prices up and it becomes a geopolitical corporate thing. So we're facing that rhetoric as well. They're not as entrenched um, in South Africa as they are here simply because we don't have that big oil and gas economy. There's been no oil deposits in South Africa. So we're not dealing with the legacies of Mr. Bush and Mr. Cheney, like you guys. But we are actually indirectly dealing with those legacies as shale gas is extrapolated to, the, to South Africa and other countries around them. I'm curious, has there been any preliminary discussions about the Marcellus Shale Gas Pipeline or anything like that? No. Yet. No. There, um, we had word from the attorneys in, in the media last week, 10 days ago, the attorneys of Chevron indicated that they don't expect exploration licenses in South Africa to be issued during 2013 because of the expected environmental appeals. So it, it would appear that we've been doing a good job. Mm -hmm. And on that basis, despite the assurances and the, the perhaps the secret agreements that have taken place, I think people are scared to make big investments into that type of infrastructure. We have been very verbal, and I've addressed international shale gas conferences a year ago and said, you know what, guys? Because they were all sitting there with their checkbooks. Uh, in November, I addressed one as well. There are two or three that occur in South Africa every year because it's a, it's a big hype. And I said to them, if I were you, I wouldn't be putting your shareholders' money into shell gas just yet. So I'm sure I'm not on the Christmas card list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're hesitant to do that, but it's all waiting. It's all planned. It's talked about. Um, it's there. And just like you're seeing, I believe that there's one planned for a very close find here, a processing plant. And there's that big one that's planned in Louisiana. Uh, I think where Sassel, our South Africa's oil and gas company is getting a, something like a $16 billion subsidy. Something I can't count. It's in Louisiana? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's there. It's there. But um, we can certainly harm them by taking the source of their financing and making the source of their financing nervous, for sure. Um, how many South Africans don't have electricity 
you referred to that. How, what's the percentage of Afri South Africans that don't have electricity? And what are you doing in South Africa for renewables? What kind of renewables are you involved in? I would say, um, if I had to estimate it, probably 15 to 20 percent. The South Africa, the rural areas are very uh, far spread. It's like Wyoming. So you can drive for 50 miles and not see between between villages. It's not like here where they one on top of each other. As you go around the corner, there's another village and another one. You can drive for 50 miles. And so a lot of the distances uh, geographically are very, very difficult to get reticulated power to. South Africa's got, apart from next to Brazil, the best solar radiation in the world. And our, before shale gas mining came along, and shell, our integrated resource plan, which is the government's plan to bring electricity to the nation, had a lot of renewable blocks or projects in it, and that's still there. So it hasn't yet, this whole thing of shale gas mining hasn't yet manifested itself to the extent that it's starting to interrupt the development of green power. We're actually getting a lot of development in wind and solar, but primarily now solar. Um, and it's very, it's very easy to do in South Africa, apart from the fact that it creates the sustainable, properly sustainable jobs in renewable energy. The figure that I have to mind for the United States at the moment is that there are 119,000 jobs. Um, and I don't know if it was statewide or nationwide, that are linked directly to renewable energy. And those, <clears throat> to my mind, are sustainable jobs. So that's what, that's what we're going after. But <clears throat> as an environmentalist and one that is opposing shale gas mining, I don't want to be callous and say it's not my job to create or to give the people of South Africa electricity. It is my job in this campaign to point out that these problems, these promises of electricity for the people, even were shale gas exploration to be successful and it be converted to full scale production, and finally the compressor stations and the gas pipelines and the gas turbines and everything else to generate the electricity, and the reticulation of that electricity from the power plants. It would probably take 20 years to get into the hands of people that do not have electricity at the moment. And everybody in this room knows that solar energy is easy to produce, it's easy to deploy, it's modular, it can be done at residential, light industrial and light commercial level, and it can propagate across the country rapidly were it to be given the same chance that the fossil fuel industry has had for the last 150 years. So my argument is, with 7 billion people on the planet, and the proposition that I've given many times to the shale gas conferences, is this simple proposition. At some point in time, all fossil fuels will be exhausted. We'll stop that's the proposition. Now, now let's talk about your argument that renewables cannot supply baseload. When fossil fuels are exhausted, what is going to supply the baseload? And do we need to wait for the point that there are another two billion people on this earth before we try and get to that step? That's, that's the argument. Renewables, fossil fuels, baseloads. The uh Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement came into my uh, foray about a month and a half ago. That's a uh, agreement between 30 foreign countries, all Far Eastern, and America. Because it's free trade, Japan just joined four weeks ago, which was the big one. And in their article, they said they want our oil and natural gas. With this agreement, we can't refuse it. Um, we have to allow them to... to uh, do it. So, and then it's two part. National Geographic last month has the uh, the fracking on the front. In reading it, um, they're burning it all off because it's in the way of the oil. Yeah. So our um, 
the reason I'm going to ask you, I'm going to turn into a question both of these. Number one is there's the people that want our resources. It's all foreign. It's all foreign. We will never be able to use as much gas we have here. They're going to have to export it to make money, like you said. But then to try to convince all of us here in New York and Pennsylvania that they're after this gas, they burn it in wherever they can't yeah. pipe it. So um, in, in, in South Africa, it, are they, I mean, the infrastructure, there's no money here to set up infrastructure now because they're, they drive, the gas is so low priced. Yeah. That's why I believe they have to drive it on the world market to bring it up. But what, what do you see in South, in South Africa for infrastructure, not drilling yet, but here we worry about infrastructure because yeah. that always comes first. There's no infrastructure in Perfect. South Africa. If we need, in Cape Town, there's a, there's a hospital called the Red Cross Children's Hospital. If they need new equipment to save children's lives, that money comes from the community. Our radio stations and our TV stations go out on radiothons and talkathons to raise the money. There is no money in South Africa for this infrastructure. And I guarantee you that although there's no money, and people are going without the basic necessities and without proper houses, the state will put that money together to distribute the gas so that Shell and the others can get their profits. If they get that chance. So it's a, it's a minefield. Um, and I'm not an economist. I'm not a scientist, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a doctor, I'm an ordinary person that understands that this is wrong. And uh, we've got to counter it wherever we can. And it's, it's just, I had the most amazing meeting this afternoon, I'm going to tell you who it was with, most of you. Well, probably, I'm sure all of you will know of him, and he, he asked me to send you a special regards, and those of you who are friends with him will know that it was meant for you, it was Tony and Graffia, and he said, pleased to tell you that, that he said hello. And it was the most amazing meeting, to listen to a man like that, an academic, who has put his whole life into academia, and who is an acknowledged expert in his field, and a man of acknowledged integrity and standing in the academic fraternity. And he has maintained that position. He's not even, and he described to me this afternoon, we discussed the spectrum, the continuum between scientific, what he calls the tra trans transom, pushing papers over the transom over the top of the door for people to read as a scientist and saying, that's my study, read it, throw it away, accept it, comment on it, whatever, it's up to you. And the far other side of that continuum as being an environmentalist that says, uh, I'm going to go and bomb a fracking site. And he is very clearly on the right hand side, which is where he has to be as an academic. The moment that he moves to the left, he's going to lose that credibility. So, just as an aside, that's the line, the line that I walk, or that I try to walk, is in the middle of those two. I'm not a scientist. I'm beyond advocacy. I'm not absolutely an activist in that I won't incite people to do anything that is unlawful. I don't have the guts to join Sandra Stein Bravo in jail, especially in this country. If I, I don't even want a parking ticket in America because if I get into trouble here, my visa's finished and I, and I tend to spend a lot of time here. And on the other side of the spectrum, the people that do take the extreme action by walking in the middle, we're not alienating them. So we have communication with them, but I don't get involved in it. And we have communication with the corporate side and the scientists, but we don't necessarily align ourselves to them. So we're steering a very careful path through the middle. And I think that that's where it's at. Because if you go on either side, you tend to you alienate groups on both sides. I had a, a very interesting, I have a mentor in a man called Franklin Son. Might, some of you might remember the name. He was a South African ambassador to the United States for a number of years around the time that Nelson Mandela came into power. And he was very close to, to Nelson Mandela. He's become, through this fracking campaign, not that he shares my views, by the way, a bit of a mentor to me in political terms. 
And he said to me, Jonathan, what you need to understand is that probably you and the government have more or less the same views. You actually both want the best for the land, the continent, the people. And you need to try and find that middle ground. And that's what I intend to do. But I'm not, under any circumstances, prepared to submit to the spectre of shale gas mining. I think it's, I don't think that's part of that middle ground. I think there are other things. If you said to me, in Africa, what is your solution? I would say sustainable agriculture, which is accessible and affordable to everybody, just like the oil and gas industry claim. Shale gas is available, accessible, affordable, whatever the three A's that shall be used. Um, agriculture really is accessible to people right where they live. Um, tourism is a big money earner and potential money earner. And renewable energy. And the combination of those things with progressive government and far thinking and far sighted government will help us out of this. I have driven past homes in Pennsylvania and on the way here today from the big highway through the smaller back roads where you can see people are struggling. There are dilapidated homes. I drove past a place where there was an elderly man sitting on the porch of a trailer which was maybe a little bit bigger than this table and he had a small sort of aluminium trailer behind him and that clearly was his home. So people are battling and it's difficult to tell people like that when the land man comes along, turn them down, have the guts, think about the rabbits and the bears and the bees and the birds. So I think the point that has got to come across to people like like that and people in these counties is that unless you care absolutely nothing for your family and future generations you need to you need to be able to say no if you don't care if it's two people and you've got no children and no relatives and you don't care what happens after you're dead in 30 years time then sign the lease let them frack your land but it will be fracked and it will be destroyed and that land will be finished and those are those are the points that we need to, to try and bring home to them. I'm sorry, I answered your question in quite a convoluted way. Yeah. It's like a, I love a captive audience. John. Have a, going off that, what has been some of your greatest success and the best ways of conveying this and getting the political access and some influence with the government? What is What messages and what actions and what conglomerations of individuals has been most effective for you? I think that we've established one of the things we did right at the beginning of the campaign was to build a media presence and we established that very effectively to the extent that we certainly regarded as the foremost opposition to fracking in South Africa and it came home to me last year on the 8th of September when the moratorium was lifted. In that day I had calls from Los Angeles Times, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post. BBC, all of the international media, and every journalist in South Africa that had a cell phone or a computer or television or any way to contact us. So that, that media platform is very, very important. And to do that, one of the things I concentrated on was always being truthful and always being accurate and developing a relationship with the media. That's not to say that they can be subverted because a professional journalist will present or try to present a balanced view to his or her readers unless it's a specifically an environmental journalist or specifically an oil and gas or financial journalist. But generally I found that at the beginning they were skeptical because they also had heard Shell's side of the story and thought about the benefits for the country and finally this great thing had arrived that was going to save the whole continent. And as time went past and we started exposing the lies and we started showing the skewed perspectives, we, grew, we earned their grudging respect. And today we have, we have their respect. So media is the one thing. Um, research in terms of keeping abreast of what's happening around the world is absolutely critical. Um, I've made that my business. And of late, and I must tell you that there are about 100 media articles a day coming out of the United States. 
some of them uh, about somebody's cat that drank frack fluid or got sick or <coughs> air two, two really important stuff uh, globally um, and one needs to, to work through all of that and um, I'm not quite as up to date as what I was but I can still go head to head with the oil and gas industry in the debate they'll say there wasn't this or that and they'll say listen this pavilion there's the Gee family of Pennsylvania there's Chesapeake on the 18th of April 2011 in Bradford County uh, it was Tuana Creek we went into Susquehanna River so you need to be able to counter them with that sort of stuff also what I found very useful was at the where they give public presentations I don't know how clever they are here but Shell in South Africa loves to go around beating their drum of openness honesty and transparency and they have this dog and pony show slideshow which i call which sort of runs and it starts off with that big disclaimer with all the fine print that you know no matter what i say yeah, it's actually you can't sue me <laughs> um, but at the end of it they always have a question and answer session with the audience and that's when it gets dangerous for them because if they are presenting to an informed audience and they get a specific question sometimes their answer catches them up i've got them for instance recently within the context of illiteracy in south africa saying even if shale gas had a million jobs in south africa we couldn't employ any south africans you know thousands of jobs yeah and they're promising they're promising all of these jobs so that type of thing the question and answer session gets very very dangerous for them um, I make a point of getting in their faces. If we're going to do a presentation um, or a speech, I write to them ahead of time and I say we're presenting there. Come along. Come sit in the audience, ask us questions. If you like, come and join us up on the stage. We're happy to have you there. In contrast, obviously, to their secret presentations. If we write an article about them, when it goes to the press, I send a copy to the chief executive to the shop. Just to let you know. You mentioned in this article so that you might enjoy reading it first. <laughs> <laughs> so in their face all the time. And the same and the same with the politicians. Um, I would love to be in a position where we could cooperate with the government of our country to develop the country sustainably. But if they are if they are going to make themselves puppets to the oil and gas industry, then they need, need to get what they deserve. Talking about sustainably, that's a, that is a word that has been hijacked by the oil and gas industry. Yeah. And we yeah. need to work against their use of it. There is nothing sustainable about anything to do with fossil fuels at all. And I, I encourage you to take them on on that. There is, they, they say, oh, so it's, it's a sustainable bridge fuel or, or it's a sustainable fuel and it will create permanent jobs. There's nothing permanent or sustainable about anything in fossil fuel. So I zone in quite a lot on these semantics. And then the volunteers, I think that you, you all understand where that comes from. I'm a volunteer. I haven't been a salary for two and a half years. Um, there are three people, three people in our organization that are in salary. One is a young lady of 25 or 26 who holds a master's in environmental management. She worked for us for two years without a salary. Every time we tried to pay something, she deposited it straight back into our account. Finally, she's taking something. Mm -hmm. We have a fundraiser who we pay part-time because we can't afford her full-time. And I have an administrator who earns the equivalent in dollars of $350 a month. And she's a third year student in chemistry, comes from Gabon, she's very fluent in French. And so with the European thing and the French and the chemistry, the understanding of chemistry, I thought she'd be somebody good to have on the team. Those are the only people in TKAG that are going to sell it. The rest of us actually spend money, our own money to do what we do. And we do get public donations, but um, as you guys will have experience in the United States, it's, it's not going to bad. I looked at, I know if I could get 2,000 South African families, 
only 2,000 out of all the families or people in South Africa who would be affected and who are opposed to Shell Gas to give me 50 rand every month with the equivalent of $50 for you guys. If you've got 2,000 families to give me $50, it's $100,000 a month. Imagine what your campaign would be like with $100,000 a month coming into your accounts. And 2,000 people doesn't sound like a lot, but to make it happen is difficult. So the fundraising, fundraising is an issue. Ma'am? Yes, I was just wondering, you were talking about how the word sustainable has been hijacked by the oil and gas industry. Yeah. And um, when people refer to the Rutland Commission's definition of sustainability. Yes. And there's some things in the literature where the notion of sustainability as well, it's just sort of a weasel word, we should find something else. And in your global travels and in your experience, um, do you think that the, um, the concept of sustainability is robust enough to um, help us think about um, the vision for our future energy system? I think that if we don't embrace the concept of sustainability as a robust concept and the only, the last straw that we have to grab onto, we're finished. Um, there's an author that I've read recently called Paul Gilding, and he writes a book called The Great Disruption. There are many similar books, but we are really globally and environmentally in the end times. And if we cannot embrace that and start doing things like making sure that our rate of consumption of fossil fuels proceeds at a pace that is lower than the rate of depletion of fossil fuel reserves. If we can't understand that this blue sky economic thinking of exponential growth to satisfy the aspirations of poor and impoverished people is not going to happen, we're finished. And our children and our grandchildren are finished. And we used to talk, the world used to talk and say future generations, future generations. It's this generation. There's certainly people in this room, you're a younger generation than me, um, but there are people in this room in my generation that will see, I think, an absolute collapse of world social and economic systems if we don't do something. So, and it's very difficult, I think that you will probably agree because I'm assuming, I'm right that you're an environmentalist, and I sometimes look across this whole spectrum of environmental issues, and it frightens me completely. It sometimes, it, it, it's terrifying. And so died in the wool, died in the wool environmental campaigners have said to me, Jonathan, you are involved in a fight against fracking. Focus on that and leave the other stuff to the other people. Um, so to answer your question specifically, yes, I think it is robust enough. Sustainability in a very simplistic definition um, is an activity or, or a way of proceeding that allows the present generation to meet its needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. That's a simplistic de definition. We should be able to meet our needs in such a way that we are not robbing young Americans and unborn Americans of their ability to meet their needs in the future. Thank you. I wonder how you got started in this effort and how your effort grew. Say again? How did, your, how did you get started and how did it grow? I read about it in the newspaper one morning in Cape Town in January of 2011 and about six in the first few months before that I read a few small reports you guys will know it always starts off in the newspaper little piece in the back pages or whatever something about shale gas mining you, you might notice it when you page it through the paper but it's tiny and as it progresses with anything it starts going towards the front page and I picked up the newspaper and the front page of our, of our big daily newspaper, the Cape Times in Cape Town, 
had an article about one of our industrial billionaires, a man called Johan Rupert, standing up to Royal Dutch Shell in a town in the Karoo called Kraafrenet, which is sort of in the center of the Karoo, very uh, culturally tied to a lot of South Africans. And he was taking them on about the fact that they wanted to site a big truck stop in the middle of the town. It's a very historic town. It's like doing a truck stop um, in the middle of, I don't know, uh, middle of one of the quaint villages in Pennsylvania or on the waterfront in Boston. And also, it was around their public meeting about shale gas mining. So when I read that, I realized, one, if he's involved, it's quite a big thing. Secondly, um, if Shell is involved, it's something that we need to understand. And I, at that stage, I was nothing more than a person that likes nature. That's it. I just enjoyed the outdoors. <laughs> but I thought, my instinct told me there was something wrong. So I got onto a talk radio show. Luckily, for me, I think you guys know how difficult it is to get online, but I got on the air. And I said, listen, I've just read this article. I'm not sure what the story is, but my instinct is telling me it's something that we need to be aware of and that we maybe need to investigate better before. Because the way that Shell were talking in that article was, when we drill, this is what we're going to do. That's how much we do. That's where you're going to use the gas. This is what we're bringing to the country. It was just like a fake of plan. And I also found a professor who I knew had a very close, in one of the local universities who had very close ties with the Peru. And she was well known for those ties. I didn't expect that a lot of other people who had read the article would also phone her. And I was the first person that phoned her. So she turned around, she said, told everybody, don't worry, Jonathan Deal's coordinating this thing. Just contact him. <laughs> so in a very short space of time, I found myself at the thin end of the wedge without even having volunteered of this growing opposition. I started a Facebook page which grew to 7,500 people and then stopped counting as Facebook groups do within about four weeks. Um, we formalized Treasure Guru Action Group and then we started really going through it. And during that time I attended my first Shell public meeting as well. I was naive enough at that stage as somebody that just loved nature, so this was the emotional side which they loved to bash yeah. since the days of Rachel Carson. Um, to think that if I became emotional or tearful, they would say, you know what, we can see you really upset about this and you love the crew. Well, we'll go and draw someone else. Well, it didn't take long for me to, to get a rude awakening in that same meeting. It was a very short, uh, in stature, mining engineer called Ellen Dodson who stood up, um, sounded Scottish to me, but he worked in the Netherlands. He said, well, my job is to explore, and that's what I'm going to do. So I realized very quickly that the tears and emotion weren't the way to, to, to get through any debates with them. And from there it started. We had to learn, we had to inform ourselves on the technicalities of shale gas mining to the point that we can debate with the oil and gas industry or with proponents of shale gas mining anywhere at any forum. I'll go, I don't care. In any, I don't mind if it's 10,000 people or five people are going to debate them without preparation because it's the truth. Um, there is a point where, where I recognize very clearly, and it's a very important point for those of you that do debate, you must understand where your technical or your scientific knowledge reaches an end. So if you are debating a geohydrologist that is a pro-industry geohydrologist, you need to understand where that line is. And say to them, you know what, to hear it no further because you're now trying to use your training to make a fool of me. And you're going past the actual real aspect of this debate. So we had to learn about that. We had to learn, I had to learn to become a politician. I had to learn to work with a volunteer team. I've never worked with volunteers in my life before. And I have to accommodate everybody from a housewife who may well lead me to one of the biggest funders that I have not yet met, to a geohydrologist or a scientist or a professor who has an extremely valuable input and everybody in between. That's so you guys will know that's the that is the makeup of your volunteer team. Everybody's got an opinion, everybody's got a valuable input, and you need to learn to work with it. We had to learn to do to manage the media as well, and we had to learn to set up our 
our viral media, the Facebook and the Twitter and the, and the websites and that sort of thing, which is critical in these days. I was visiting Cornell this afternoon, and I said to Sharon when we drove away, I said, imagine, just imagine if we could capture the attention of those university students. <laughs> imagine if we could capture their attention. And I know, I've spoken to the universities in South Africa, from one side to the other. And it's difficult to, to I find that the law students, and the economic students, and some of the social sciences students are interested. But the others are not, are not necessarily at that place where they are ready to work. But so that's the story of, of how I'm going to them. What is the status of public opinion and knowledge about this issue? In South Africa? In South Africa. About the same as in the United States. Probably 1 in 50. For every person sitting here, I would imagine that there are another 49 that might know about fracking. Um, and if they do, they might care. And if they do, they might have some idea of the real risks attached to it. Uh, certainly in South Africa, I can walk out, and I'm talking about educated people, uh, chartered accountants, bankers, um, pharmacists, doctors. Frankly, what's that? What are you talking about? So the information is a very, very big issue. It's, a, it's one of the biggest issues, and it, it's actually one of the things that is in our hands as individual environmentalists. You can go out, and as I said to you earlier, if you need to, do it one person at a time. But say to yourself, every day, I'm going to make a point of telling one person about Frank, if it takes me five minutes of my time. One person, because that one person, if you inspire them enough, we're going to do it to another and another and another and eventually it will cascade. But people need to understand that what they're being fed is not the truth. So, so we have the same issue in South Africa and even worse. We have a far more polarized society than you have. We are 44 years behind you in political changes. 44 years, the last of the, the great political changes in memory certainly <laughs> really took place around right about 1960 in the United States. And we are 44 years, uh, 34 years, sorry, to 94. We're 34 years behind you. And it's a very rural population and a very widespread population. So it's very difficult for me to go into that community and say, you know what, I wasn't here two years ago. I was leading a privileged and a sheltered life in Cape Town. Now I have become aware of this threat to our future as South Africans. And I want you to understand what that threat is and I want you to join me in fighting it. And quite rightly they will say to me, where were you two years ago? Why do you need our support now? So the battle is to convince them that I'm not looking for their support for me, I'm looking for their support for them. And that's the battle that you have with the disenfranchised and the, the poor people in the United States who are desperate to accept the promises of the land bank. Sir, Hi, have you managed to meet with any people holding current political office? And if so, what should the steps have been? I'm delighted to inform you that um, I had the privilege of meeting with your president last week in his office. Oh. Really? Oh my God. Um, yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. And it's an indication yeah. of not necessarily his resolve to change the current direction of his administration, but at least his sensitivity to the environmental issues. Um, I've also met with a number of your senators and most encouragingly, a senator called Nancy Pavley from California has invited me in the week of the 6th to actually come to the Senate in California and recite my story in front of the governor. 
and hopefully make something happen in terms of the moderation or not happen. So there has been a good reception, a very good reception. Um, I met with on Thursday five of the senior people in the American, in the US EPA, um, including Lisa Garcia. Um, so and they were they were quite receptive. They might have just been very polite, but I did get the point across to say that if I had any voice in the United States, I would stop prevent shale gas mining starting anywhere where it has not happened yes, yet yes. and curtail it where it is happening. Yes. Thank, Thank you for your question. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, we're going to have time for one more. I told you I love a captive audience. So. <laughs> <laughs> I can carry on. Um, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about, you said that when you look across the spectrum of environmental, I think you said environmental activists were very afraid. And I wasn't sure if you meant you're afraid because of the extremity of the issues or you're afraid because environmental activists are themselves not speaking in strong enough terms. No, um, what, I, what I meant to, to bring across was I'm, I'm afraid of the absolute spectrum of the challenges facing us. So I might be standing up against fracking, and part of the fracking debate is global warming. But there are a whole group of environmentalists whose job it is to just convince people that global warming actually exists. Right. So, and I'm thinking to myself, how can you fight fracking if there's a whole group of people that are being told by the oil and gas industry that global warming is a hoax? And then I'm thinking to myself, well, do you fight fracking or do you fight this hoax about global warming. Um, and I need to concentrate on that and leave the people like, uh, is it James Hansen, the NASA scientist? Yeah. James Hansen? Yes. Um, who was 30 years ago writing about global warming. Um, leave him to fight the global warming battle. Leave Sandra Steinbrauber to fight the medical battle. Her and Peter Colborn, uh, Oswald and Van Berger, those people. Um, on, the, on the medical side, but so that's that's what it is. Rather than no, I'm, I'm not scared of the extremity of the fight at all. I will. It's seven days a week, 18 hours, 18 hours a day. This has not been a sightseeing trip around America. We um, we drove yesterday morning. We drove uh, the day before yesterday. We left Kellettville or Kane in Pennsylvania. Drove to Harrisburg. Spent the day and the night there, drove from Harrisburg to Albany yesterday, and we're in Ithaca today. Um, I'll be in Colorado on the 28th, Texas on the 3rd, West Virginia on the 6th, on the 5th, California on the 6th. So <clears throat> that's, what, that, that's what it takes, and um, that's what we need to do. And it's, um, it's been the most amazing it's been the most amazing discovery for me here in the United States, and I don't know if it's because I speak like an Englishman, <laughs> but people like to listen. Um, we, do get, we do get a good reception in, in South Africa as well, but I just, in the, in the receiving line after the Golden Prize Ceremony in San Francisco and in Washington, I've had a dozen job offers, and they were serious, and they were influential people, they stayed there. Stay in America, we want you here, we want you to, we want you to talk. We want you here. So, you know, I think it's a global fight. I think it's a global fight. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm up for it. Thank you very much. Introduction in thanking one other person, which is my colleague with New Yorkers Against Fracking, Sarah Kelson, who I'm going to bring up. She's going to speak briefly about businesses against fracking and food not fracking. Sarah. 
Yeah, so I know a bunch of you here tonight, and uh, thank you for coming. And I just want to give a pitch. All of you who live in this region know how crucial to our economies, our food and our agriculture, and our wineries and breweries, and all of our farms in this region are. And so we're going to be kicking off a campaign. We actually kicked it off this month, April, to really highlight the breadth of our, you know, our sustainable economies and what we've really got as an asset in this part of the world, in this part of the state, and what we're protecting. And so we're kind of trying to shift the momentum to fighting against, and we're going to be fighting for. So this is what we're fighting for. We're fighting for our food, we're fighting for our agriculture, and our economies that we've built in this region around these sustainable industries that are going to really you know, bring us seven generations of abundance in this region. So I have flyers um, to hand out to folks, and we're going to be having a meeting. Our New Yorkers Against Fracking meeting is going to happen next Tuesday um, from 6 to 8 p.m. in the Tompkins County Board of Warner Room in the library. And I will send out an announcement. Um, hopefully you all can put your names on the list, the sign-up sheet. And I will send out an announcement. And um, stay tuned, because we'd love for all of you to, wherever you go, wherever you live, whoever you talk to, we want to we want to spread the word that we want more people involved in this. And we want to say thank you to all the farmers and all the, the food-related businesses that are doing the great work to, to keep this going. So thank you for coming, and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you. I have, uh, I'm going to take just a couple minutes and update on a couple things about the debate that's going on in the campaign in New York State, a couple developments uh, just very recently. I started off tonight by saying that we are in the red zone, so to speak, whereby there's no specific process, there's no specific uh, entity of a delay right now, it's just is unknown as to when the governor and the Department of Health and the Department of Environmental Conservation comes out and says, we're done, we did the health study, go for it. Or comes out and says, well, we need to go back and we need to look at more health studies that are going on in other places, the EPA study, the Geisinger study, the UPenn study, other independent studies that are going on, in essence, kicking the can down the road. In encouraging them to do that, we've been driving home the health message that fracking jeopardizes our health, it threatens the air we breathe, the water, water we drink, etc. About a couple weeks ago, we did a very broad-based campaign called callcuomo.com. It was another website. We brought all of the different environmental and health and other organizations together under one banner that said, you have to wait for these outside studies, you have to go back and you have to do a real comprehensive health impact assessment. You can't move forward with fracking at this time. It's not keeping your promise, Governor Cuomo, of making the decision based on the facts and the science. That was a broad-based campaign. We've been driving thousands of calls into the governor's office saying, wait for the science, we don't want fracking, while simultaneously keeping a very strong message based on the economics and the environmental uh, perspectives. And for many of us, that this is the wrong choice for New York State, it's the wrong choice for America, it's the wrong choice for the world. Just say no to fracking. Let's move forward with renewable energy, agriculture, sustainable jobs, etc. So with that, I'm encouraging everyone to continue the calls to the governor. We are not out of the woods yet. It was only the assembly that passed the moratorium on fracking. That is not in place. We are not safe. Now is the time to keep up the pressure. The second update I have that's really come about this week, oh, I'm sorry, let me back up one second. I want to highlight just in our own messaging that in the last week the Medical Society of New York State came out again and rehash that they believe we need a moratorium on fracking, we need more study, and we need to determine the facts. The Medical Society of New York State represents 30,000 physicians. It's a very powerful voice, represents many of our county health departments. They've come out and said, we need to understand the impacts before we make a decision on this. They join with the American Lung Association of New York, the American Academy of Pediatrics of New York, representing 6,000 New York physicians, concerned health professionals of New York, and hundreds of doctors and scientists and medical experts and other health organizations around the state and the country echoing that same call. We should be emphasizing that in our own communities, with activists, letters to the editors, op-eds, phone calls, etc. The newest development happened on Earth Day. The Independent Oil and Gas Association of New York, this big industry lobby group, came out with an Earth Day postcard and letter <laughs> where they declared that fracking is green. <laughs> open up the green package. It's right under your earth. Just open it up. They've sent it to all the legislators. Talked about sustainable energy, transition fuel, the green jobs, how it's going to be the best thing since sliced bread for New York State. 
They also sent a letter signed by IOGA and apparently all of IOGA's organizations, which were a couple hundred. Among those organizations were some friends. Ecology and environment seems like a good group, right? You may recall Ecology and Environment is this so-called independent consulting firm based out of Erie County that performed New York State's economic impact analysis in the ESCAs, the study that went back 2011, we all commented on, still not complete, is actually holding a bracket at this point. The point here is that the same consultant who did our economic study is a member of the Independent Oil and Gas Association and is actively lobbying the governor for fracking. This is a conflict of interest of epic proportions. We worked out the state, we exposed this in the media on Monday, in that article that ran across the state from John Campbell. Today we held a press conference in Albany in the morning with Nightbird, one of the good government groups, came out and said, Governor Cuomo, you have to rescind the ESCAIS. This doesn't work. You can't have a pro fracking lobby group writing the ESCAIS. We've got coverage across the country in the Associated Press today. Gannett, NPR, etc. Now E&E and &E in College of Environment are coming up to try to deny that fact that they're actually a member. Tomorrow we'll have more information about other companies that are members of IOGA that were also consultants on the ESCAIS, helped write the ESCAIS, respond to comments. We'll be highlighting that as well. As you see these articles come out, I guess my action item here would be call the governor, express your outrage. This is one of those cases where the process is defective, the facts are defective, we're calling for the governor to throw out the entire ESCAIS and start over with an objective, independent, transparent process. He needs to hear this from more and more people right now. We have a petition online, go to frackaction.com, right on the front page, you see the links for it. Call the governor, write a letter to the editor, express outrage, tell the story, make sure people know, especially if you see more articles coming out. Um, and with that update, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague Renee, who's going to talk more about other stuff that's coming up. quick and I've got my uh, organizing voice in gear so and I'm a little short for the microphone so it works um, but thank you so much Jonathan once again for coming tonight um, and uh, my name is Renee Vogelsang I work with Frag Action across the state we are a statewide group with volunteers and organizers um, across the state working for a statewide ban on fracking uh, I know we didn't talk about this before, but most of it, you probably already know us, um, but we started in 2010, for those of you who don't know us, to enact a moratorium in New York State with actions across the state at the DEC offices. Um, obviously, that led to a moratorium amongst many other actions. Uh, at the end of 2010, uh, including a big press conference with Pete Seeger and Mark Ruffalo, uh, epic press conference in the Capitol, um, and you know, three years later, we've been continuing to build out the movement to ban fracking across the state, putting out that demand for what we knew was necessary to actually protect the people um, when many others were just calling to regulate this industry. So um, since then, we have co-founded a coalition called New Yorkers Against Fracking, which now has over 200 organizations across New York State calling for a statewide ban on fracking. We also have over 1,000 businesses calling for a statewide ban on fracking. We have over 300 faith-based leaders calling for a statewide ban on fracking. And there's also many other organizations like Concerned Health Professionals of New York and elected officials to protect New York, which Dominic Frangillo in the back as a founder of, um, and Sarah Kelson, who also worked very hard on, um, over 600 elected officials across the state who are supporting a halt on fracking in New York State. So anyway, that is all to say we have this massive movement in New York, hundreds of grassroots organizations, many of them are presented, and also our friends in Pennsylvania, many of them are here, Craig Stevens in the back who's done amazing work here at Scroggins, and Iris Bloom over there, doing amazing work in Pennsylvania and they've also been doing amazing work to help us here in New York State so we're really grateful and thankful mm -hmm. that you're here tonight as well um, and we just have so much solidarity uh, so I just want to say that coming up we're going to be working on another massive rally in Albany we do it every spring so why not stop this spring uh, and we're looking to do a big rally uh, in early June we're looking at June 4th to do not only an anti-fracking rally, but also a pro-renewable ener energy rally. And we're really looking to Governor Cuomo in New York State to be a leader on a renewable energy co economy and also stopping fracking. He has this opportunity as someone who has future political
political ambitions, to set a legacy for protecting the people, protecting our water, protecting our food resources, our air, and leading the way to a different way forward with renewable energy. We're also calling on other states to participate, so looking to Vermont, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, everybody to come on up to Albany on June 4th. Uh, preceding the rallies, we're looking to do local actions. Um, so in Ithaca or other Finger Lakes uh, towns, you know, we can do uh, regional action saying this is why I'm going to Albany on June 4th. Uh, so everyone in this room, please sign up on the clipboards that we're passing around if you want to get involved. Talk to Sarah, talk to me. We're going to be organizing buses. We had four buses from Ithaca due to lots of work from probably people in this room and others who are not here tonight to go to the state of state, the state of the state address in Albany, which we had 2,000 people at in a month. Um, we got 2,000 people to Albany for the, go the governor's state of the state address. We want to get 5,000 people to Albany on June 4th. So in order to get 5,000 people, every single one of us in this room needs to band together, um, get eight buses <laughs> from Ithaca. Uh, or, you know, across the entire region. And um, I'm going to wrap it up with Alicia, who's going to talk about some other local Ithaca stuff going on. Uh, but thank you all so much for coming tonight. So, um, I, I'm you know, very blessed to have gotten to know these guys uh, with the track action stuff. And um, was. You know, they were talking about you know, the food and the sustainability and so forth. And I'm like, you know, bed and breakfast, I'm a bed and breakfast owner. And I thought, well, I, I, you know, we should band together too. And I came up here and talked to Cash, and Cash was like, you know, it's not just bed and breakfasts. It's the resorts, it's everything. So now we're our group, which we've begun here in Ithaca, is begun here. But going statewide, instead of just a local b, &B thing, it's gone statewide. It's called the, our grassroots um, accommodations coalition um, for sustain, for energy sustainability for 2030, uh, which is what uh, the new guideline from the pro sustainable energy people is saying is our possibility date. So we're going for it, and so we're we're uh, accommodations, and all eyes are on New York right now. And when we were all uh, protesting down in D.C., if you say you're from New York, they'd be, yes, New York, go to New York, because they know that we're fighting. And so we are, you know, really trying to push this through with accommodations where people from all over the world come. All over the world, eyes are on America and New York anyway. So um, we definitely are, you know, wanting to get Governor Cuomo's attention by saying, you know, you have political aspirations, you better do something a little bit different than what's been going on. So um, we're hoping to be a force to be reckoned with. And if you are an accommodations owner, um, we really hope that you would like to sign on with us. And um, this coming up on the Ithaca Parade, we have um, um, our little parade float has been accepted. It's called Uncle Frick and Anthony Frack. <laughs> and, um, it's just put a little levity in a really a challenging situation. I, as you, you talked about, you know how how fearful one can become, but you know really to keep a, uh, any kind of a movement going, you really have to put some joy and some levity into it. So this is that moment, as the Ithaca Festival always provides for us. Um, we will have a very fun float. Um, we will be mainly in pink. We're we're uh, going along with the idea that if you can't. Join this revolution, revolution if you can't dance, and so uh, we're the pink flamingos. So we're going to be in pink, and so if you would like to wear a pink, a pink feather, pink anything, and then come along and walk with us, we where our little motto is um, flocking, not fracking. And so you can join the flock and um, tell them to get the flock on. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, so come, we will uh, be along with that little message that's going around emails. Um, I will be glad to keep you informed with that so that you can, um, if you want to be uh, a, a little float member, a little flamenco, I'd love to have you come along and have a little fun sharing a message in a real positive kind of a way and like a hard way for a deep hearted message. Okay, thank you very much. And, Thank you everyone.
for coming tonight and before you leave this. Sorry, before you leave the There's just one thing that, excuse me, there's one thing that struck me, and that is that the majority of the people in this room are women. So I need to ask, where are the men? <laughs> We're still asking that, Jonathan. Men, and it's a known fact that men respond to immediate threats. So if you're sitting in a steakhouse and there's a really crass guy in the next door table and he's swearing at the top of his voice in front of your kids, most men will probably ignore it. But if there's a guy out in the parking lot kicking dents in the side of the Corvette, they'll be up and go and kick dents in the side of him. So they do respond to immediate threats. And if you can bring it home to, to the men in your lives, that this is an immediate threat. They need, they need to get involved. They need to step up to the plate. It, it really is, it's just, it's skewed. And um, it, it is an immediate threat. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm going to